Mother's Day is amazing. Uh, it's actually, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, Anna Jarvis, Philadelphia, 1908. Uh, she wanted to honor, actually, her mother, who died. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, to honor her, she actually started this thing called Mother's Day, which actually got a lot of traction. Five years later, it becomes a national holiday in the States, and we've been doing it ever since, and that's why the carnations and everything else, it's, it's actually something that has been around for a while, and... Um, and I think it's kind of fitting as we're going into a sermon series on Amos, which is one on justice. Like this is, the whole book of Amos is one where God says, you have been unjust, unkind to the oppressed. Like when we think of mothers, when we think of the mothers in our life, um, that is kind of, God has implanted different things between men and women, and women are kind of hold that sacred space of, not exclusively, but mothers have that special space. Uh, in our lives. And so mothers, if you're here or you're going to be a mother or you've been a mother for a long time, we just want to say thank you for embodying uh, this justice of God uh, and, and being at the forefront on that. Uh, it's such a gift, such a privilege. So we're going to have like pictures outside afterwards. And, and so take up your, uh, do some pictures with them. But interestingly enough, last five years of Janice's or Anne's life, she spent advocating against Mother's Day, which is weird because it becomes so commercialized. So this morning, can we not make it commercialized? Can we just give our mothers a hug or those ladies in our lives that have a motherly presence, just the women in our lives, thank you, thank you for abiding that. We're so grateful you're here. As we go into the sermon series, uh, it's gonna just resonate with you, but we're grateful you're here. And could you do that? Could you give your mother a hug this morning if you haven't already done so? Could, is that a thing we can do, right? Awesome, okay, good, you're with me. Now, as we go into Amos, it's not an easy book. It's actually, it's, someone said to me this morning, it's like, how do you preach on Amos? It is not easy because it's not light and fluffy. <laughs> it's not airy. It's not, it is actually quite heavy as God takes Israel to task for not being uh, a good reflection of what he wants them to be. And so it's a heavy book this morning. As Amos is called into uh, confront Israel of the judgment that is coming for their sin and their stiff-neckedness. So if you have a Bible and you're willing and able, would you stand up? We're gonna to turn to Amos. We're gonna last, starting at verse six, chapter two. And we're gonna read what God says through Amos to the nation of Israel. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Israel, even for four, I will not relent. They sell the innocent for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They trample on the heads of the poor and on the dust of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed. Father and son use the same girl and profane my holy name. They lay down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. In the house of their God, they drink wine, take as fines. Yet I destroyed the Amorites before them. Though they were as tall as cedars and strong as oaks, I destroyed their fruit above and below. I brought you out of Egypt. I led you for 40 years in the wilderness. I gave you the land of the Amorites. I also raised up prophets from among your children and Nazarites from among your youths. Is it not true, people of Israel, declares the Lord? But you made the Nazarites drink wine and commanded the prophets not to prophesy. Now then, I will crush you. As a cart crushed when loaded with grain, the swift will not escape, the strong will not muster their strength, and the warrior will not save his life. The archer will not stand his ground, the fleet-footed soldier will not get away, the horseman will not save his life. Even the bravest warriors will flee naked on that day, declares the Lord. So God, as we enter into your sacred text, you made it very clear how you feel about mankind, about the oppressed, about what it means to follow you, what you're asking us to do. So Lord, would you be honored in this moment this morning? Spirit of God, would you rest in this place and would you be made known and, and would you pull back the layers of our heart, speak to the depths of our spirit, change us, shape us into your image, that we reflect you well to the world around us. Oh God, let us heed your word and let us obey. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Have a seat. Have a seat. As I ask the question, what does God require of you when you look at the injustice around the world? 
Like, what does a God ask of you? What is, he, what is he looking for from you? A few years, a few months ago, on my Twitter feed, um, it's not Twitter, it's called X, I guess now, but Twitter feed, and as I was scrolling through, um, a picture came up of somebody, of a, of a gentleman that was homeless, and you can see that he had, he had gone through a hard life. And, and it wasn't really the picture that caught me, but what was the caption underneath that did catch me? And here's what it said. This homeless man has a degree in chemistry and worked in the field for 10 years. He's laid off and could not find another job. Months later, he ran out of money and became a DoorDash worker. He got his car stolen and then ended up on the streets. And you guessed it, he became an addict. Now, when I tell that story... There are, there are going to be a tons of thoughts and feelings running up in this room. In other words, is this, is this him problem that he didn't take agency in his life and he should have worked harder or should have done something differently? This is the result of his actions? Or is this actually a broken system? Does he actually have agency in a system that actually doesn't allow him to succeed? Like the questions that you and I are going to naturally ask is like, how do we fix it? At what cost are we going to fix it? What is the worth? How, what is worth it to fix this cost? Whose responsibility is it? To fix it. But there's a million other different injustices in the world. It's the husband who died way too soon in life while others have lived a long, long life, even though they've God and they should have lived longer. Or it's a, it's a one of a child being bullied in school that you couldn't stop. Or maybe, maybe it's fighting a court battle with a client or a customer or whatever when you've done right all the way along and they still took you to court and you're being dragged into it and it just isn't fair. Or maybe it's the economic climate. Statistically speaking, if you're 30 years old today, you are worse off than your parents were at the same age. That's unjust. That's not right. That's not fair. It shouldn't be this way. Or sweatshops, big business. I mean, you name it. There are so many injustices in the world. The injustice, when I went to Guatemala and I held a baby, and that baby's mother had dropped it off, or dropped them off, her off rather, because she couldn't take care of it anymore. Is that her fault for not taking agency or is that a broken system that should be fixed? What do we do with this injustice? How do I navigate this? And so we collectively feel an unsettledness when it comes to the injustice and we together move the, or try to move the ball forward towards this idea of social justice. Right? This is the common term in our lexicon today is the idea of social justice. It's, it's a term that's over 150 years old coined by a uh, Jesuit priest named Luigi Tirolli. And, and so he coined this in 1840, but really it goes way, 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 way back beyond that. The Christian doctrine, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has always been concerned with social justice. This is his MO, it's his character. If we go right back to the creation narrative, it was the Imago Dei. It was God breathing in his life into you and I that gave us dignity and worth and value. Because of God's breathing into you and I, we have dignity and value as people, right? This is rails against the idea of, of evolution, where really the weak are subject to the, or the weak are subject to the powerful. This pushes right back against that and says, no, 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 no. You as an individual, by merit of who God is in His character, have value. You have dignity. And so our idea of social justice actually needs to be very grounded in the very character of God. It's actually not a left or right issue. Like think about the Garden of Eden, think about Eve. On the right, some would say, well, hey, look, Eve had agency. She got what she deserved, and she now is going to bear the consequences. Those on the left are going to go, well, hold on, she's in a broken system. She was deceived. She didn't know any better. She was lied to. Okay, that's fair. But the problem is, it's not a right or left issue. It's not an issue of right or left. It's an issue of good and evil. Social justice has always been an issue, a struggle between evil and good. Christopher Walken, a theologian, makes the connection. says that social justice is a spiritual problem. And as a result of being a spiritual problem, it carries, now hear this, it carries a divine weight. Because it's a spiritual problem, it carries a divine weight. And he goes to say this. But no human struggle can bear this divine weight. 
This way lies to totalitarianism and making any means legitimate in attaining an end that is so pure, so noble, so absolute. It is this logic that led to the terror of the French Revolution with the guillotining of 17,000 people. It's this logic that led to the Chinese Cultural Revolution in which intellectuals were murdered for the unwelcomed views, to the killing fields of Cambodia to the name of creating a better society for the future and the various oppressions in pursuing of an orderly society. When it's a left or right issue, this is the outcome. When we divorce social justice from the very character of God, this is the outcome. We remove social justice as a, from its theological framework, grounding. It becomes something altogether different, and this is the outcome. It's a spiritual problem that must be grounded in something outside. Now hear this, outside of altruistic selves. We don't do this for our own sake. We do this because it's theologically an issue of good and evil. And it's always been the case. I mean, if you look back to God, it's his very character. This, this idea of, of this dignity of individuals, this social justice, has always been in the character of God all the way through. I mean, let's take, for example, you, so let's talk about uh, Egypt, coming out of Egypt with the 12 uh, tribes of Israel. The tribe of Jan, Dan was always placed on the backside of this entourage going through the desert so that they could protect the weak and the vulnerable. That was their job. Their job was to sit there and make sure those who were, who were uh, potentially vulnerable were protected. Or let's maybe talk about, oh, I don't know, let's talk about sacrifices, right? In, in, the, in the mosaic sacrifices, in the culture around it, there was a very strong connection between the elite, the powerful, the rich, the wealthy, and the deities. In other words, there was a, there was a link up top, and those who could afford to uh, offer up the right sacrifices, were in good standing with their deity. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob comes along, and he actually looks at it differently and says, bring what you can. And if your heart is in the right place, you have access to my grace. It's always been a God of equality. Or the law of gleaning. Another, I don't know if you ever heard of it, but it's called the law of gleaning. And the law of gleaning means if, you have, if you're a farmer and you had a field, what God would instruct you to do is to leave the edges of your field standing. Don't harvest them. So that if those who were marginalized could come and harvest them themselves, giving them agency and also supplying. So the system allowed for that. God has always been one who looks after people. It's in his character. I say all this to simply make the point that God is a God of justice. His character has been consistent and human dignity derives from his character. So then we're gonna look at the justices around the world. As, as name any injustices, whether it's this one or this one, I mean, there's a myriad of injustices that we all struggle with, whether they are local to ourselves or global in nature. We all deal with injustices, and we say, how can it be? This isn't right. It shouldn't be so. It should be different. And you know what God says? You're right. It shouldn't be this way. You're right. My heart aches as much as yours does. In fact, my heart breaks. In fact, do you know that your heart breaks for those things because God's heart breaks? Hear me. Your heart breaks in response to God's heart breaking. That's what he's endowed in you and I. And we have a righteous anger to try and make it right. Knowing that we can only do so much, but the God will make things right. The just will meet, the unjust will be made just. And this is where we start with Amos. This is where Amos comes in. As he talks to Israel and says to Israel, God has had enough because things need to be made right. So we get into uh, the words of Amos. So here we start. Now, the book of Amos is one of the minor prophets like we talked about with a myriad of other minor prophets, and he's been tasked to talk to Israel. So the words of Amos, the one of a shepherd. Man, that alone preaches in itself, right? If we, this is somebody who really was just happy enough to be a farmer. 
He was a layman. He was your doctor, or he was your mechanic, or he was your HVAC guy, or he was your secretary. He was the normal person who was plucked out and tasked with being the spokesperson for justice. Now, it's interesting. He probably didn't even write. Like, probably did not write Amos. He had a scribe with him through all this. So we're not talking somebody who's intellectually at the peak of society. Rather, he plucks who he needs to. And what's interesting is that the locus of authority does not lie with him. That's the whole point. It's not him who's tasked. It's actually his obedience and God speaking through him, and that becomes important because God is now the locus of that authority. So we carry on. So he's a shepherd from Tekoa. It's like a, like, think of a small town. The vision he saw concerning Israel years before the earthquake. This is a huge step. This is a massive event referenced several times in scriptures, but this kind of grounds the, uh, grounds the timeline a little bit. When Uzziah was king of Judea and Jeroboam was uh, a son of Joash. Now, a little bit of graph. Uh, for those life groups, you're going to have this later on. You can explore it. But just a bit of a framework, because sometimes it's kind of helpful. Like, how do these books all kind of interlock together? This is kind of how that works. So we are what's called in the Assyrian Age. Right? And this Assyrian age um, is 760 AD um, and is, uh, or uh, BC, uh, and, seven, and Amos is one of the first books. So Amos and Hosea are written to Israel, Isaiah and Micah are written to Judah. Okay? This is the, what's called kind of the golden age for both Israel and Judah. Uh, economically, politically, very stable, very protected. It was, it was a grand moment in, 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 in their history. If you want to kind of overlap this, if you go to 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 26 or 2 Kings, uh, 2 Kings 14, uh, this, is kind of, this is where these kind of stories overlap a little bit. So if you had some time this week, go to those places. You can kind of see how these stories intersect. So this is the golden age of, of Israel and Judea, and specifically Israel. And Amos is tasked with one thing, to look past the facade because, yes, indeed, they are rich, they're wealthy, they're politically strong, everything is good, but there's a religious apostasy, a moral and social collapse happening within their culture. There's political corruption. And God has had enough. And the Lord roars from Zion. This is a text repeated over through Amos. But God has had enough. Ever say to your kids, like, enough is enough? Like, enough? I don't even know what that means, actually, to be honest with you. Like, enough, like, if you think, like what is it? enough is enough? Like, I don't know what it means, but I get what it means. God's, <laughs> welcome to English. <laughs> enough is enough. I've had, I've had enough. And this kind of outlines the character. He says, I roar. This is the kind of showing us what his character is, that the end has come, and the injustice I have seen and I have called it. And so we get into later on. Now, a lot of words, uh, they're, don't worry, they're all in English, but I just want to give you a bit framework of kind of Amos 1 and 2. So we don't have to go read it all, but I want to kind of show you, because sometimes like, how are these things structured and lots of words and paragraphs and, anyway, so let's just bear with me. So this is the section we just t- talked about. And what God had done is he actually chastises eight, that's called the eight oracles, to eight different to eight different nations. Two of them are Israel and Judea. So this is Israel's uh, section here. Now what's interesting, first thing you would notice is God actually chastises all of them. It's interesting, he chastises all of them because what he says is consistent to Jew and to Gentile. All of them are guilty of some sort of offense against people. And so we see here that God is consistent he, you see that God is consistent. And so the framework that he uses, just a quick overview, the framework, it's kind of an introduction formula, so thus says the Lord, every one of them, a bit of a variation, but this is kind of the structure, introduction formula, and then there's called a numerical expression. If you're gonna read it this week, it'll look like basically X, X plus one, and it's, and it's this idea, it's a Hebraic poetic term which just talks about repeated sin. It's just kind of a Hebraic terminology. And then it kind of moves into a specific sin that they have done. Uh, announcement of judgment. I will send fire. I will destroy the citadels, which, by the way, I had to look that up. Citadel is just uh, a wall. Um, and then finally, the closing argument. So he kind of repeats this all the way along to all the surrounding nations, including Judah. And then he gets to Israel. And boy, is he mad. 
Like, I, I don't, I'm not much of a lecturer with my kids, but do you ever like notice that when you're really angry, you say a lot more, right? That's kind of what's happening here. It's like a lot more is happening here. And the rest of the book focuses on Israel. Now, why, why is he saying that much more about it? What's the point here? Well, because quite simply, quite simply, God expects more from Israel. He has an intimate relationship with him. They should know. So we move on. So what's Israel doing? Well, they're selling silver for the needy for a pair of uh, selling, sorry, selling the innocent for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They trample on the heads of the poor as the dust of the ground, not justice. We can all agree with that. And then the father and the son use the same, go and profane the holy name. Well, like that's, that's wrong. Like that needs, we need to deal with that. So, and we start to, I think, I do anyway, maybe you don't, but I do. I'm like, I, I'm appalled at this one. Right, that whether this is incest or whether this is prostitution doesn't really matter. The point simply is, like, I'm, I'm personally appalled at this one. But I noticed myself jumping past these two real quick. There's five indictments altogether, right, that God lays against Israel. Please realize he's just as angry with this as he is with that. He's just as angry with the fact that somebody was, this happened, as somebody trampling on the head's uh, of the poor, denying justice. He's just as angry with these as he is with this. God is consistent in his expectation. But Israel is morally bankrupt. And so all these things are happening. And I wonder, church, just a question. I wonder, how often do we as a church grab certain sins that we gravitate towards? Right, certain ones that we grab, like, that's wrong. We're going to deal with that one. But then sometimes we forget some of the other ones that are maybe there as well. Are we just as convicted about these as we are about that? Are we? Are you? Am I? Okay, carries on. Um, the house of their God, they drink wine, take fines, it carries on. And then we get to why God's angry. And he goes on for a while, but I think we can sum it up with this statement right here. You see, Israel, you should have known better. See, Israel, I was the one who took you out of Egypt. I brought you out of Egypt. I held on to the, I was faithful to the covenant that we made. I made a covenant with Abraham, and I held up my end of the bargain. I was, made a covenant with you at Sinai, and I held up the bargain. If anybody should know what it's like, you should know my character. You should know my character. I've been faithful to take you out of Egypt. You of all people should know me. You of all people. Church, we of all people should know what God has done for us. The call to Israel is the same as to us. What are you doing? You of all people should know my grace and my love and my compassion and the works and the things I've done in your life. Of all people, you should know. You should know because I have loved you and I have shown you. And it's your job now, Israel, to go and tell the other nations. Notice, your job to tell the nations. That's why he's angry with them because he has already done these amazing things for them. All these other nations kind of know what's going on, but Israel, Israel has seen the hand of God. Israel has seen the hand of God move in their lives and change their lives, and they now are called to represent him to be an extension of his character. This is who I am. Now go and tell the world. But what do you do? You do that. You should know better. You should know better. And so God says, enough is enough. I am a gracious God, but I'm also a holy God. I'm a gracious God, I'm a holy God. And sin will be punished. You see, we are to be an extension of God. Not, there's no altruistic motive trying to push us forward. No, no, we are in response to God's faithfulness. We are called to be faithful, to represent who he is. But if we're gonna be stiff-necked, he says enough is enough. And sin will be punished and injustice will be made right. I, uh, my New Testament or my Old Testament prof 
showed me this and I thought was absolutely brilliant. In God's character, Old Testament, New Testament, God is a God of justice and he will make right what is unjust. And so you have the evil acts and the evil acts are stacked against you over and over and over again till finally what happens is it gets so heavy it hits the button and God's judgment comes. That's what happens. Because it's only God's judgment that would empty that evil tray of your sins. I mean, so this is the role of Jesus, right? To this is, he says, only I can empty that evil tray, but if you carry on, hit the button, judgment will come. And that's what he's saying to Israel. He's saying, Israel, your time has come. Now, what he says to us often, and what he says to Israel often, rather, is to say, turn your face towards me. This is a consistent theme all the way through Amos. It's, it's turn your face towards me and do good deeds. As a result, in action, in response to my faithfulness, be faithful. Turn to me and act in such a way that you represent me well. We don't do the things to garner favor from God. We don't act well. James talks about we don't act well to do the favor of God, but rather in response to what God has already done in us, we then act a certain way. We respond to it. But notice here, this justice, and justice will come. Things will be made right. We're promised that. All things will be made right. But this is his burden to carry, not ours. Let me explain. My kids are going through long division. Anybody remember doing long division? Everyone having to like do long division later on in life and actually having to figure out how to do it again? Is that, is that, am I the only guy where it's like, what do I do with this? And you're trying to look smart to your kids, but like, you're like, I, I got nothing. I got nothing. Right, so when you're taking five and, or you have th- yeah, five and you're, you know, three into five, you're, you're left with a remainder, right? You're left with this number that you don't know what to do with. You've done everything you can to make the one number fit to the other, but it doesn't quite fit, and you're left with an unsatisfactory answer. And like, all of us hate seeing that remainder. It's like, well, can we not fix this so we don't have a remainder? Like, it doesn't feel nice. That remainder, that remainder doesn't feel good. When we look at the injustice of our world, the remainder doesn't feel good. You see, we are called to do right, to make the world right, to be shalom, to be peace, to be an extension of the character of God in this world, but we're gonna not, don't kid yourselves, we're not gonna be able to solve all the world's problems. So the question is, what do we do with the difference? What do we do with the remainder? And this is where the beauty of the gospel comes in because we are now given the tools to say, it's yours. God, you are gonna make all things right. You will make all things right, and I am called to merely steward. Do what I can, but my, and I ought to have a righteous anger, but that righteous anger should not supersede the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Did I get them all? Somebody correct me. What am I saying? What I'm saying is we ought to have a righteous anger anchored in the reality, knowing this is a spiritual matter and God is the ultimately the one responsible for this. He will make all things right. And he's calling on to Israel. He's saying, I'm gonna make things right. Israel, you had your chance and now judgment will come. And it's gonna come in the form of the Assyrians. And trust me, when I say judgment comes in the form of the Assyrians, that means nothing to you and I. But that strikes fear in the heart of Israel because the Assyrians were brutal. One of the most brutal, brutal groups of people Horrendous, horrendous. Like this, this honestly was a judgment. But God has said, I have had enough. I'm a gracious God, but sin must be restored, properly ordered, and it lasts and it rests with him. And so in response, we are then called to, to exemplify his character in the world, to represent him well, to do everything we can, to be busy for the gospel and actually make a difference and do the things that we need to do so that social, we can bring as much shalom to this world and, and there is a sense where we are creating justice or we are leveling out justice. But the difference, the remainder, what's left to be done is owned by God. It's his character that identifies injustice. It's his character that ultimately makes it right. 
So then the question is, do we trust him with the outcome? Do we trust him with the outcome? Church, we are, to be, we are tasked into action. We did Mercy Weather Shelter this year, last year, this year. Last, somebody told me this morning, actually, that last night at Street Church, two more people came to know Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yes, go share the good news of God's character, who he is. Show the world what God's character is. As I've said often enough, get busy. The gospel calls us into movement forward. Take care of the widow. What are we doing that's uncomfortable? What are we doing that's uncomfortable? And the second thought I would have is, is this. When we see the injustice in the world, we're called into action, but when we have a difference, we're grounded in the character of God and we are given the tools to navigate that injustice. Where our righteous anger doesn't turn into unrighteous anger. There's a righteous anger, but it's grounded in the fruit of the Spirit, in the character of God. Because the whole idea of social justice, the whole idea of that somebody, it is wrong. It is wrong to kill a baby. It is, I don't care what religion you are. I don't care what faith you are. I don't care where in the world you are. I don't care what your gender is. It is easily agreed upon that killing a baby is wrong. To make an extreme example, that is wrong. But that is there because God has breathed it in you and I. And we are responding to his justice. We are merely responding to what he's called us into. And so the question becomes, what are you doing with the difference? When you see the injustice in the world, is it God's problem or is it your problem? Like I said before, it's a spiritual problem that has a divine weight. As Watkin would say, our human efforts do not have the capacity to carry enough, sorry, the human struggle cannot bear this divine Wait. And so we need to re-anchor our idea of social justice into the character of God, knowing that all things will be made well. All things will be made well. So as we're going to go into communion, it's interesting, uh, the common verse uh, that we often use for communion is found in 2 Corinthians and we usually start in verse 23, but it's interesting that Paul actually does a preamble That's it, that I think is appropriate for today. He says this, and again, this is before the, the communion piece. He says, so then, when you come together, is it not the Lord's Supper that you eat? For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in, or do you despise the church by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. The communion table is a beautiful space where all of us come equal. All of us have dignity. All of us have worth. All of us are worth something. And, 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 and I think often we go through the motions of communion not realizing that all of us come equal, and that God has dignity in all of us, and we are a tasked to represent his character of just mercy, love, grace, in humility. Turn your face towards me, he says. Over and over and over again, turn your face towards me, repent, and I'm quick to forgive. I'm quick to forgive, but sin must be punished. Please, Israel, turn towards me. So as we come up for communion, if I, uh, those who are going to serve communion, if you can come to the front. You know, it's, Chris isn't here, so I can, I can make this comment. Can't defend himself. But I'm always struck when I see Chris lined up, receiving communion in a humble posture. And it's just a good reminder for me and all of us that we come to the table 
an equal table. And so church, as we reflect, I would ask that you take a few minutes. And the question I would have for you is simply this, is how, what does God's character show you about yourself? What is his character? What is it who he is? And what does, contrast that to who you are, what does it reveal about you? And then what's he asking you to do with it? So we're a bit ahead of schedule. We're not rushed out of here. So just take a minute, a minute or two, and just pray and think through. Set your heart right. And God says, turn your face towards me. I'm quick to forgive. Turn your face that you can represent me well and my character. So we have air traffic control at the top. For those of you at the top know the drill. Uh, we have gluten-free bread where we, where we have bread and, and juice. Uh, so if you're gluten-free, uh, you can easily partake. If you're comfortable with the original cups that we had, those are at the front as well. Um, but I'm going to leave it with you for a minute or so. And whenever you're ready, come up, take, and then please hold on, and then we'll take communion together. As we were reminded, as we are reminded of God's grace and love, his, his justice, his mercy, his kindness, as we partake. So whenever you're ready.
says as you come together and you do this together he says for I received from the Lord what I've passed on to you the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he gave thanks he broke and said this is my body which is in you do this in remembrance of me and so as we take this we are remembering who he was, who his character was, what he has done. So let's take together. In the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant, my blood. Do this whenever you drink it and remember Remember me. So let's take the cup together. If you're able, will you stand? 